Week two, coming back and having live services, it's awesome. To be able to see some faces, to not be talking to a camera again, is really, really good. Thank you for being a part. And if you are watching us online, thank you so much for being a part of our online community. Um, I was telling folks before service started, like, one of the crazy things about this whole journey is just really seeing, uh, again, who the real church is and what their church is about. We say it over and over again, and we put it on t-shirts that it's not a building or an event. And you guys have really shown in this season that that is true. Like, the church is you. It's people coming together in the name of Jesus, worshiping together and trying to change the world together because of the God has changed us. And so it's a good, good time. We're in week two uh, of Ecclesiastes, and I don't want to take too much time before we dive in. But if you did not make week one, let me catch you up a little bit. This is one of the most confounding, confusing, and interesting books um, of the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, you know, all of it included. It is a very, very interesting book, and um, it's one written by a guy named Solomon. Most of you probably know who he is. He was one of the greatest kings um, who's ever existed um, of any peoples, but by far he was the greatest king um, of the people of Israel, Um, one who was blessed with supernatural wisdom, more wealth than anyone could imagine. Um, He built the temple of God that existed for hundreds of years in Jerusalem and really set in place uh, the the worship and sacrificial system um, that the Jews followed up until the time uh, of Christ. And so he was a very, very influential man. Um, who lived a long life. He was king for over 40 years. And for that day and time, uh, that was a long time. And in all of his time, uh, he gained a lot of knowledge. He gained a lot of wisdom. Um, He loved many, many people um, and and many women. I mentioned last week uh, that this is a gentleman that had uh, a thousand wives and concubines combined. And and just, you know, that, that, that to all of my brothers, that can sound really interesting. But just think about it this way. Like, he could literally eat a meal with a different woman uh, for three years and never have the same person eat with him twice. And he's married to them. Like, he's, he's connected. Like, that, that's not good. That's, that's, that's bad. Um, and at the end of his life, I believe he sat down to write kind of his what is life all about work, and it is Ecclesiastes. And you think for somebody as wise as Solomon, as blessed as Solomon, as rich as Solomon, as influential as Solomon, as loved as Solomon, as known as Solomon, you think if he was going to write a book about what is life all about, it would be a very positive, happy-go-lucky success story. And it's not. Instead, if you've ever read Ecclesiastes, it's really a book about how empty life is. It's really this work that we're kind of diving into. I don't share it with you to be depressing, um, but he wrote this work um, after discovering, hey, I've lived a long time. I've experienced everything there is to experience under the sun. Remember last week I mentioned that that phrase appears 29 times um, in the scriptures, and that word vanity, you know, grasping after the wind, appears 36 times in this book. He has discovered under the sun, there's just nothing worth grabbing onto. Under the sun, all the things that we think are so important, all the things we think are worth our life, all the things that we are focused with in our time and our energy, all of those things he has found, if you don't have God, if you don't have Jesus, those things are worth absolutely nothing. Today, as we go into chapter two, guys, if you want to go ahead and pull out uh, your your app, your outline, you certainly can. Uh, We're going to be really focusing on this reality that, uh, that, that Solomon really had a lot of stuff. I mean, like a lot, of, a lot of things, more things than in some regards than we can imagine. This, this man, he had gold and silver brought to him uh, literally by the boatloads, fine cedar and woods um, like you could not believe. It, it, took, it took several years to build his palace out of cedar and gold and the finest of materials. This guy had servants galore serving every single need. This is a guy who probably never washed his own hair, probably never trimmed his own nails. Um, hopefully he did brush his own teeth because that's just weird to who's doing it. Can I get an amen to that? Okay, so like, like, but then he, every need he ever had was immediately and quickly served. He had lots of stuff, and yet we're going to see today that as he's writing this, this particular chapter of Ecclesiastes, he's reminding all of us from somebody who knows that the things we want end up leaving us in want if we let them. So that, like, we, 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 we live in a society that's convinced, man, if you just had this, then life would be full Joy would be yours. Success would be an open game. And, and he's kind of saying, like, listen, that's a lie being presented to you because as someone who had all the things, I discovered that having all those things ultimately really, really does mean nothing. Now, today, um, before we jump into our scripture, I, I did want to brag a little bit on my family. I don't often do that too, too much. I tell you a lot about my family, but I don't brag on them a lot. Um, we just found out this week that uh, my son, Nathaniel, who is a lot like his dad, which basically means um, he drives me in 
my wife absolutely crazy because an eight-year-old me is not good. Everybody says amen in their hearts. Yeah, so imagine the talking of me and the energy of me and you're eight and so you don't have any good sense. Yeah, so he drives us crazy. Like, we actually found out that he um, actually is, um, uh, okay, it used to be AG when I was a kid. Now it's AIG, but he got into AIG, um, which is really cool. I did not <laughs> get into AIG when I was his age. And what's really fascinating is uh, quantitatively, so there's, there's three categories, if you're not parents, you, you've forgotten this. There's three categories. One is verbal, one is nonverbal, and one is quantitative. In the quantitative field, my son got a perfect score. So like literally, like, yeah, thank you. Um, so he's way better at math than his dad. My mom's, a, my wife, my mom, his mom, my wife is, is, a, is a math teacher. And so he got that all from her. Um, today, the reason why I mentioned that, my son was really, really good at math. He, 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 he connects things very well. And for someone like myself, um, trying to connect an equation is a difficult thing. What we're looking at today, Today, I just want you guys to know this is like the math of the book of Ecclesiastes. This chapter, and you need to read the whole thing on your own, because we're only going over a few verses in it. You need to read the whole thing on your own because this chapter is kind of like the plus sign that all of a sudden makes everything equal out that Solomon's trying to say. And so it's a really important chapter, and I'm excited to jump in. Let's go ahead and do it. If you guys are taking notes, first point of the day, let's just be real, let's just be honest. We all want to have pleasure. So Solomon's speaking on wants. And the things that we are drawn to, the things that we long for. And if we just, if we're just, can we just be real at Ignite Church, both here and online? All of us like pleasing, feel good things, and all of us want to avoid negative, difficult, painful things. Can I get an amen? Okay. So yeah, most of you are not looking for bumblebees to step on in your yard as you go walking around. Uh, most of us are not searching for difficult and challenging experiences to, to bring us pain. Most of us, if we had it our way, Life would be easy, life would be fun, life would be filled with pleasure, life would be filled with joy. And like, that's not bad, that's just kind of the way that we're wired. And that's okay as long as those things are being led by the Holy Spirit. But the problem is because I'm a sinner, and because you're a sinner, because all you watch online, you're a sinner as well, we tend to look for pleasure and for joy, for satisfaction and for comfort, not within the bounds of God's will, but we tend to go our own way. As a matter of fact, when you get down to the core root of the whole garden story with Adam and Eve, you know, like they were in a perfect environment, the, the, the garden of paradise. They didn't have to work a single day. Everything was brought to them. I mean, look, I'm not going to get too much into the fact that they weren't wearing clothes, but like they didn't need AC or, or central heating. It was like the perfect temperature to have nothing on. You know what I'm like, like? I don't even know what degree that is. Some of you, you're weird and you want it 65 and others of you, you like to sweat and it's 85. I don't know how God worked that out, but somehow it was the perfect place and yet... The moment that they were offered a pathway that they could find pleasure, satisfaction, and fulfillment on their own, they took it. And guess what? We would too. So let's look at what Solomon had to learn about the, the pursuit of pleasure. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, starting with verse 1, it says, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure. But surely this is also, and that word is vanity, remember? That word that we looked at, Hebel. That, that, that grasping, when surely this is also grasping the wind. Well, I said of laughter, madness, and of mirth, what does it accomplish? I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my heart with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their life. That, that last line, guys, Solomon is writing this. This is a work of poetry. He's writing it poetically, just understand that. So it's not super clear and easy to discern what he's talking about. That last line is really important. Basically, he's saying in that last line, I made, I set my heart to discovering every single possible means that people find pleasure, and I tried it. So what Solomon is saying, without, without saying it, what he's saying is, if there was a drug, I tried it. If there was something to smoke, I smoked it. If there was something to inject, I injected it. If there was a woman to try, I tried her. If there was a, a, a pleasure to enjoy it in, I did it. If there was something pleasing to the eyes, I watched it. If there was something that, that made my hands, feet, you know, and all kinds of other places feel good, I did it. Like, he pursued pleasure to its fullest extent, unashamedly, and with the resource and ability that most of us can only dream of. So this guy, he knows what it means to pursue after pleasure. And what he found that to be is, he said it in his own words, he said, it's madness. It's madness. It's folly. Like, yeah, all the people at the bar look like they're having a great time because they put six, you know, cups or something in their bodies and everything's funny in that moment. But the next morning is a different situation. 
We pull up Instagram and Facebook and it looks like people are experiencing these incredible experiences. I mean, you know, let's just get real. There's sometimes that I, I pull up social media and I see couples doing all these things and going all these places and experiencing all these sites and there's this measure of jealousy there, but we have no idea what's behind the scenes. That same couple that today is so much in love in Italy and you're just like hating them kind of in the depths of your heart because you wish you could be them. The very next week they might be putting on social media that things are not good and that somebody stepped out and, 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 and left and lost. The pursuit of pleasure and of happiness is ultimately a very, very long, very, very lonely and a very, very empty pursuit. Um, and yet, let's just, again, be honest enough to say like we're all very drawn to pursue it. And I think that our, draw, our, our natural draw to pursue pleasure, and to pursue happiness is actually a God-given thing. We just have to remember who is the center of happiness. What, what pathway leads us to true pleasure? What, what road shall we take to truly find joy? And I just want to remind you, I know all, most of you here know this, and all, all you watch online, you know this. The only pathway to pleasure, the only pathway to joy is found in Jesus. And yet, I mean, just, and I know that you know that here, but how would your life be different? As a matter of fact, you guys should write that down on your app somewhere. How would my life be different if I truly believed that knowing and following Jesus was the pathway to pleasure and joy? How would, my, how would I spend my time differently if I really believed that? How would I spend my money differently if I really believed that? And I want you guys to know, Pastor Jason does not have this all figured out because I surely was excited when PlayStation 5 came out this week. And you know, what that? that's just me, yeah, my nerd self. And again, there's nothing wrong with having, a, having something like that. But if it becomes my pleasure, if it becomes my satisfaction, if it becomes my escape, if it becomes my joy, there is a problem with that. We all have something that tries to compete with the true giver of joy and pleasure. As I was studying these very, very open scriptures, I mean, again, you know, it, it, Solomon's taking some of the things that we enjoy the most, things like, you know, laughter and pleasure and, and mirth, and, and he's kind of flipping them on their heads. Um, it reminded me of a movie that I watched um, a long, long time ago. You know, I'm a movie buff. Um, and many of you probably have never seen this movie because it's, it's that old. It's old enough that you probably hadn't, hadn't seen it. It's actually one of Leonardo DiCaprio's, if you're a Leo fan, uh, first movies, a movie called The Basketball Diaries. And if you haven't ever seen it, I would actually encourage you to write down the title of the movie and to look it up. It is a very, very intense movie. So if you're a parent, this is one that you would want to watch before you allow your kids to watch it. But it's when, it's when DiCaprio is a teenager. It's also got a teenage um, uh, Mark Wahlberg, for those of you who are fans of him. Uh, he, was, he was in his Marky Mark days back then. Yeah, it was like that old. Yeah. Um, some of you were like, what? Yes, he was a rapper very briefly, and it was not good. But anyway, anyway, <laughs> that's a whole other story. Um, but it, it's these young, you know, really famous actors, and they're, they're, they're basketball players, whole life ahead of them. It's a true story. It's based on a book by a, a, a guy who had like, he was going to be scouted by college. He was going to get a scholarship. He was going to go play in the pros. He was going to be one of those million dollar like dream life guys. And he got involved in drugs and he got involved in sexuality. He got involved in all these things that began to divert him from his pathway and, 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 and not to ruin the movie, but you, say, you see this guy who literally has his whole future ahead of him by the, by the end of his drug journey. He, he is he is literally doing sexual favors for people in bathrooms for $10 so he can get the next fix that he needs. So like the, the, those things that promise pleasure, that promise satisfaction, that promise joy, escape, they're lies. And Solomon here is reminding us that you gotta be so careful with the pursuit of happiness. You know, our country's founded on the, you know, everyone's pursuit of happiness. You gotta make sure you're pursuing the right one for your happiness. We all want to have pleasure. I, I said this, and I, I wish I could live this <laughs> as well as just say this, but God has provided all you need to, to do all he's made you to do if your highest priority is him. And I just want, can you just take a second and meditate on that? And as you watch it online, can you, like, can you meditate on that? Like, God made you. He knit your cells together, and he knit your soul together, and he put you on this planet for a purpose. And, and, and who knows, for some of you, it could be this season and this time where our country is so broken, so divided. So he put you here for a purpose, a reason. There's a reason why you're here. And he's given you everything you need to do it if you'll just follow him. That's the, that's the key. We can get so distracted that we can miss the purpose that the God of the universe really put us on this planet to pursue. 
So we want to have pleasure where we find it. And number two, guys, the truth is we all want to have stuff. And we just need to say that's okay. Like things are nice. Things are fun. Things do bring temporary joy, temporary happiness. And even if you don't have joy and you don't have happiness, if you have more things than your neighbors, you at least win. <laughs> you know, like we, we live in a world and in a culture where things have a great deal of appeal to us. And that's not changed. It's always been that way. I mean, when you look at the way that Solomon lived out his life, and if any of you want to really check out more of his story, go to the book of 1 Kings and it tells his story. Like this, this is a guy that like, he, he had houses everywhere. He built fortifications and military installations everywhere. He, he, he did things like crazy things that you and I could never dream of, like just because he could. This guy possessed so, so much. As a matter of fact, I said it last week and I'll repeat it again because it's totally true and it is crazy like, this man was so rich, he never even saw silver things because silver was too cheap. Everything around him was gold. Like literally his forks were made out of gold. Like his plates were made out of gold. Why? Because he was the king. And like he just, he deserved, he really believed that he needed the best. And even though there's a part of us that I think naturally pushes back from that, can we just be honest enough to admit that there's a part of us that so longs for that? Like it's a dangerous thing for my wife and I as we're approaching middle age to watch HGTV. You know what I mean? I'm saying? Like we love it, we love it. And it's a safe thing for our kids to have on. But the danger for me is I, I cut on HGTV and I see this 27 year old couple buying this $850,000 house. And I'm just like, what do they do? Like, you know, what is their, like, who are these people? And, and, it, and it, like, you start to feel this all of a sudden dissatisfaction, discontentment with what you have. Even though you have no idea what their story is really, really is. We have to guard our hearts so carefully against things. As Solomon speaks on things, this is what he has to say, Ecclesiastes 2, 4. He says, I made my works great. I made my works great. I built myself houses. I planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens and orchards. I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools from which to water the growing trees of the grove. I love the fact that he includes that detail. He's like, guys, I built these crazy gardens and then I realized, oh crap, I can't water them. <laughs> so then he's like, well, I gotta, I gotta build all these waterways and all these pools to water these ridiculous mile long gardens that I've made. So he's like, it's like my stuff necessitates building and buying and possessing more stuff. And it does for us too. So I acquired male and female servants and I had servants born in my house. Yes, I had greater possessions of herds and flocks than all who were in Jerusalem be for me. In other words, Solomon's saying, as I look out from the highest point of the palace of Jerusalem, which was kind of, Jerusalem was set up on a mountain. It's like, I look out at the fields and I'm telling you, you can't see a, a spot that my, my, my animals aren't there. They're everywhere. All my stuff is everywhere. I can survey things and it's all mine. He had lots and lots of things. My wife and I have uh, gotten kind of addicted to this, this show. Maybe some of you have been watching it. We've, we've binged our way through it um, and it's been, it's been really enjoyable. I don't know if there'll be a second season or not. Anybody watch Outer Banks? Anybody had a chance to see that on Netflix? Okay. If you... Um, if you have not watched it, um, it's, it's a very interesting, uh, intriguing show. It's about North Carolina, kind of. <laughs> it's not, there's some of it that's not real North Carolina, of course. But the, the show is really all about social class. And it's really all about the rich wanting to be richer, um, the poor looking on with envy, believing that if they only had what the rich had, then there's somehow they would do better with what the rich have than the rich do. It's, a, it's really, a, it's a documentary on human greed. Can we agree? Like it's a documentary on the fact that you can have everything and, and, and all of a sudden this treasure pops up and what you have is not enough. And it's also this thing that when you don't have anything, you are so convinced that if I just had more, I'd be happy. I'd be full. Life would be different. When right in front of the, the pogues or the poor folks, remember the pogues, right in front of the poor, uh, the, the, the pogues face are the rich and they're miserable. They're absolutely miserable. As a matter of fact, remember they're, they're the ones that are snorting the lines of coke trying to make it through the day. But, and I know all, all of you in this room and all of you watching, like, you're not like, that's so crazy, that's so crazy. I can't believe people would live that way. We live that way. We live that way. Um, I've shared this several times at Ignite, but it'd be fun for you to go check it out again if it's been a little while. Globalrichlist.com. You should look that up. It's not gonna pop up on the screen, but you know the words. Globalrichlist.com. Um, it's a place where you can go and put in your income and it will tell you where in the world you rank. And I'll go ahead and tell you, last week I said, if you have a car, you're in the top 3%. 
Most of you in this room, even our college students, you are in the top 5% of wealthiest people on the planet Earth right now. But I know, you don't, I know we don't feel that way. And, like, and I, don't, I don't feel that way. I do not feel like a part of the top percent. When you take me and my wife's salaries together, we are in the top 1% of wealthiest people in the world today. And we don't make that much money, just so you guys know. Like, but, but we are in the top 1%. When you consider that 50% of the world makes $2 a day, we are very, very, very blessed and wealthy. And so the pursuit of things, it can destroy us because we're chasing after this wind. We're trying to grab on and hold on to this wind that we'll never get because the, 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 the enough is not a number. So no matter what number you get in your bank account, no matter what number you get for your salary, no matter what number of things you have in your possessions, the truth is there is no quantified number to satisfaction. It's always a little bit more. That's the number when it comes to things. And Solomon, who possessed so many things, realized this as well. I wanted to show you guys a more modern uh, version of Solomon and the dissatisfaction that things bring. And so um, I have a picture here of a gentleman. That most of you probably don't know who this guy is. Uh, yeah, there he goes, Marcus uh, Person. Uh, you probably don't know who Marcus Person is, even though he was on Forbes, you know, very successful guy. He actually created the game Minecraft. He's the creator of Minecraft. So if you enjoy that game, that's one of my kids' favorites. Um, it's one of the only video games that my daughter Gabby ever plays because you get to build worlds and she loves doing that. He created Minecraft and he sold it, get this, he sold it for $2.75 billion. So he was just a normal nerd like Pastor Jason. <laughs> created this game that people love to play, and then all of a sudden he has not M's, but B's, billions of dollars. Um, So you say, well, what do you do with billions of dollars? Well, I think it's our next photo. One of the things you do is you buy a house. That is actually the house that um, Iron Man's house was modeled after. It's It's a cool 70 million, but when you have almost 3 billion, sounds reasonable and cheap. There are walls of candy, apparently, in this house. Um, it is ridic- ridiculous. So he bought this house. It's one of many homes that this guy owns. He has houses all over the world now, can do whatever he wants to do. And the reason why I bring him to you is not to brag on him and make you feel jealous of him. In 2015, he became a little bit social media famous because of some tweets that he sent out um, describing the hurt and the emptiness that he experienced as someone who was so blessed. So I, I have a couple of those. That he, so this is in 2015. These are his real tweets. So his, his tweet name was not... The problem with getting everything is that you run out of reasons to keep trying and human interaction becomes impossible due to imbalance. And so what he's saying there is, I don't even know who my real friends are anymore. Do you like me or do you want to eat the candy wall? (laughs) Do you like me or do you really like me because you know that tomorrow I'm traveling over to Australia and it'd be real easy for you to jump on my private jet and go with me. You have no clue whether people like you or the things that you can give. Next one, share the next one. When we sold the company, the biggest effort went into making sure the employees got taken care of, and now they all hate me. And so he, when, when, he, when he sold out Minecraft, he, he, he was trying to make sure things were right for them, and now it's like, we don't have any relationship anymore. So he, lo- he had all these friendships in his company, and all of them were gone. If you ever saw the movie, social media, about Facebook, kind of same kind of thing. Like, all the people that started the company now all hate the founder of the company because of the greed that was involved in the way the company was led and run. Found a great girl. But she's afraid of me and my lifestyle and went with a normal person instead. And so he actually had a balanced, healthy, normal human person that he wanted to marry. And when she saw the crazy parties, when she saw the, it's 2 a.m., let's just jump on the jet and go somewhere crazy in the world. She's like, I don't want that life. I don't want that life. I don't want to wonder what hookers you might be connecting with if you leave me and go somewhere. I know you have access to all that stuff. Like she, she was a normal person and said, I, I'd rather be with a poor person <laughs> who will love me and be faithful to me than with someone who can give me everything materially but can never give me who they are. And, and so this is a, such a like, clear illustration. And I, again, I know many of you online here are like, you're not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, let this linger for a second. Because here's what Satan is going to tempt you to do right now. Here's what Satan is saying to some of you. Well, if you had $2.7 billion, you'd do it differently. That's what Satan is saying to you. Yeah, that's sad that he's such a weak, loser, mentally unbalanced, broken person, but that's not you. You can handle stuff. 
You can handle riches. You can handle every, having everything and everyone thinking that you're great and everybody wanting to be with you. You can handle it. Maybe you can. But can I just say, as for me and my house, we don't want none of that. Because when people start treating you like a God, it's really hard not to believe you are one. When people start treating you like you're a God, it's really hard not to believe you are one. And that's what Solomon's going through. He has walked through life with everyone bowing down to him, everyone worshiping him, everyone listening to him, everyone respecting him. And so you wonder why he failed? How could he not? How could he not? Because there's only one God. There's only one that we are, who is worthy of us bowing to. There's only one who has ultimate authority in his name. Y'all know it, Ignite. His name is what? Jesus. His name is Jesus. And we have to just remind ourselves of that all the time. I am not God, but I know him, and he knows me. Um, again, just a micro point there. Just, we've got to be real careful because the things we own, they end up owning us. The things we own... They end up owning us. The average, average American, last time I checked, $8,000 in credit card debt, many of them multiple tens of thousands in school debt, many of them hundreds of thousands of dollars in house debt, many of them, you know, it's like we bind our life to all these things, and they can be good things, but then do we own our life or do those things own our life? Yeah, they're, they're, most of us in this room, so like me and my wife, we have a house debt. Like if God called me just to leave, well, I gotta sell my house first, right? Amen. You know, like, I'm bound. If God called us to give, well, there are arrangements we're gonna have to make because most of our money has is in, is been invested in our stuff. And we gotta be really careful that our stuff doesn't own us. We are called, to own it. things are wonderful because they're tools by which we can bless others, by which we can be blessed, but make sure they stay in the right position. Finally, guys, we wanna have pleasure, we wanna have stuff, and finally, we all wanna have influence. Let's just get real. Um, more people today, young people um, today, they would rather be famous than rich. And that, that is like completely true. I'm not, that's not a pastor makeup thing. Like when, when, when youth are surveyed, they believe what is the greatest thing you can be and the greatest thing you can be is famous, known, to have influence, for your name to, to carry weight. Because, and there's some wisdom actually in that because they say, well, if I'm famous, then I'm probably rich too. So they, they understand there's a correlation between those two things. If people know who I am, I'm probably creating something, presenting something, giving something, or doing something that's valuable. And so we have a generation that they desperately want to be known. You wonder why your kids are always glued to whatever social media they happen to be connected to at the moment? It's because they want to know others and be known so desperately. And even as adults, older folks, we, we do too. We, we want to have Influence. Now let's talk about Solomon's influence. <laughs> I mean, he was a king, so that's pretty influential off the bat, right? Pretty influential. But not only was he a king, but he was also genuinely the wisest man on planet Earth. And we know that other kings and queens, notably the queen of Sheba, would travel thousands of miles by camel and horseback, bringing lots of money and stuff with them just to hear his wisdom. This was a guy who could solve almost any problem. This was a guy who could, you know, figure out the solution to any argument. This was a guy who, again, wrote more poetry and songs and mathematical equations than anyone else in his time. This guy had influence. People listened when he spoke and did a lot of things right. But you'll see that ultimately that too is vanity. Ecclesiastes 2.8 says, I gathered for myself silver, gold, the special treasures of kings and of prophets. So again, remember, People are bringing me this stuff. They're coming because I'm so influential. They're coming to me. I acquire male and female singers, the delights of the son of men, and musical instruments of all kinds. I became great, and I excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem, and my wisdom remained with me. So he's basically saying, like, guys, like, I, again, I'm speaking from experience. Like, people are bringing me stuff. I have all these people who are performing for me. I'm full of wisdom. My name is great. People speak the name Solomon, and people know who that is. People know who that is. As a matter of fact, if you're a fellow nerd like me, the name Solomon, just so you non-nerds know, he is so present even today in so many video games and so many card games, and, so many, and it's always connected to influence, power, and wisdom and kingship. The name Solomon has endured for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years as being kingly, wise, powerful, and influential. His name meant something. But guess what? Again, your name can mean something, and you can be so empty on the inside. The, uh, the, the modern-day correlation of this that really strikes me um, is uh, most of you have probably heard of a, a gentleman 
his name is Harvey Weinstein. Um, if you don't know who that is uh, in, the, in the Me Too movement that was really prevalent last year, he was one of the central figures of abuse in this. And, and many of you, if you do know, who his na- know his name, all you know is the fact that he's this dirty old man that was abusing people. A lot of people, that's what his name means now. But let me remind you that before his name meant that, for many, many years, he had one of the most influential, powerful names in Hollywood of any person alive in his generation. As a matter of fact, um, from 1966 to, ni- to 2016, so from 1966 to 2016, Harvey Weinstein was thanked at the Academy Awards more than God. That's how influential and how involved in the movie business he was. So when Brad Pitt or Tom Cruise or Nicole Kidman, I know I'm talking about old actors because you know, I'm talking, uh, you know but when those folks got up to, to receive you know, a golden man, they would thank Harvey Weinstein and God because he helped so many of them in their journey. If you've ever enjoyed a Miramax film, that was his company that he started. The thing that really blows me away to know about him is any of you here, I know online I can't see your hands, but have any of you here ever watched a movie called Saving Private Ryan? Raise your hand. Okay. One, one of the best and one of the first early, like it was a, it was a war movie and there'd never been a war movie like it. Um, Harvey Weinstein did not make that movie, <laughs> just so in case you enjoy it. Um, he actually made a movie the same year called Shakespeare in Love. And that movie is an okay movie. But it ain't no Saving Private Ryan, and everybody knows it ain't no Saving Private Ryan, okay? Saving Private Ryan was up for an Oscar versus Shakespeare in Love, and everyone then and now would agree, Saving Private Ryan is a way better movie. This is like a Forrest Gump level, you know, cultural classic, incredible movies. And most, most people, they haven't even seen Shakespeare in Love, unless you're just a, you know, a romantic comedy freak or, or anything like that. My, I like it too, it's okay. No, but... but Here's the power of Harvey Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein said, I don't care if this movie's better, I'm gonna win the Oscar, and he did. And he did. He had that much influence with the judges that even though everyone would agree that Steven Spielberg, who also is a very influential person, that his movie was way better, Harvey Weinstein had the pull to change the board's viewpoint on it. And I say all that to say, and I think we might have a picture of him with Gwyneth Paltrow. I don't know if we do. Yeah, if those of you want to wheel, so he's right beside Gwyneth Paltrow. That's the cast of Shakespeare in Love for you. Okay, so this guy who had such influence in his, in his circles and so influenced us, whether we knew it or not, what is his legacy today? All my kids know about Harvey Weinstein is that he abused women. And so I just want you to understand, you can spend your life building up a reputation and in a second, it can be gone. In a second, it can be gone. It is not worth your life. You can please people. You can please God. You can't please both. Who are you going to live for? Who are you going to live for? So guys, here's the, here's the, the conclusion of all what Solomon say. All of our wants lead us to want. And I'm saying, you know, being a little clever, saying like, when you're in want, it's because you need something. All of our wants, they, they make us needy instead of make us full. Because we can go home with refrigerators full of food and have nothing to eat, closets full of clothes and nothing to wear, bank accounts full of money, and it's not enough. All of our wants will lead us to want. And Solomon says it this way in Ecclesiastes 2.17. He says, therefore, I hated life. Remember, he was listing out all the things he had. <laughs> therefore, I hated life. Because the work that was done under the sun, it was distressing to me for its vanity, its grasping for the wind. I hated all my labor, which I toiled under the sun, because I have to leave it to the man who will come after me, and who knows whether he'll be wise or a fool. This is vanity. It's like I, I worked hard, built this huge empire, and I understand that I might only be in the ground for a year or two, and all of it could be gone. It all could be gone. He sees that it truly is Vanity, so your life is worth more than the pursuit of all these things under the sun. Your life is worth only pursuing the son, the son of God. His name is Jesus. Our last point is this, Jesus, he's the only one that satisfies, guys. He's the only one that satisfies. There is something worth your life. There is a movement worth your time. There is a presence and a purpose worth all that you are, and it's found in Jesus. I'm gonna read 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 6 says, Now godliness 
with contentment is great gain. Because we brought nothing into the world and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And so what the writer there is saying is that, listen, if you just can have God, if you can just have Jesus, then it doesn't matter what you bring in, it doesn't matter how you go out, you found the greatest treasure that exists in all of creation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment where we can come together and see, not from an uneducated author, but from the wisest and most experienced author who's ever lived on the planet, how ultimately empty a life full of things and influence and pleasure can be. And so Jesus, help us to remember that we can have every pleasurable experience available to man and still be empty and broken and lost. We can have so many things that we can't even move through our homes and still be so filled with nothingness and and emptiness. The world can know our name, but if heaven doesn't know our name, our name will be lost. Father, help us to live and love and serve you and you alone. For me and my brothers and sisters in this room, who have already received the gift of salvation. We've called out to the true King and He has saved us and changed us and filled us with His Spirit. Help us to show what He has done in our life this week. We will not waste our life pursuing the empty things under the sun, but instead we will use this life to share the glory and the beauty and the majesty of the true Son of God. Help us to make this week count because it is a gift and we don't want to miss it. And Father, I know that there are people in this room and I know there are people watching us online. If they would just be honest with themselves in this moment, they've been pursuing pleasure. They've been pursuing things. They've been pursuing being known, influence, fame, but they've never wholeheartedly pursued you, Jesus. And some of them are saying, you know what? I, I, want, I, want, I want to try this path the preacher's talking about. I want to, to attempt to walk this way that he's speaking of. Because I've tried pleasure and it's empty. I've tried things and I know they're empty. I've tried influence, I know it's empty. Maybe Jesus is full. If there's anyone feeling this today, I guess ask that you pray with me right now. Heavenly Father, forgive me for pursuing everything else and missing you I see you now I want you now and I believe that if I have you I have everything forgive me of my sin make me new and lead me where you want me to go my life is yours in the name of Jesus Amen. Amen. Guys, if you prayed that prayer, or if there's anything else in your story that needs prayer, our prayer team is available here. Pastor Josh is right over here with them on the side of our sanctuary. I'm telling you, action step. Here's where it starts. You want your life to be different, your priorities to be different, your purpose to be different. It starts with prayer, for real. And so go take a second and pray with them. Go take a second and take to them a prayer card so that as a church we can pray with you. And then after you do that, let's go out this week. And let's live for the only purpose that really matters. We love you guys. We'll see you soon. Please remember, we are going to kind of get you out of the line.